Hello, I am Ileana Douglas and you are watching Trailers from Hell and I'm going to talk about a movie that I love called Christmas in Connecticut. I like to think of it as a love story about a girl, a boy, and a house. Now after her Oscar nominated role as the cold-blooded femme fatale in Paramount's Double Indemnity, Barbara Stanwyck was looking for a comedy so when Betty Davis passed on Christmas in Connecticut, Stanwyck stepped in. It was the first of three films she made with director Peter Godfrey. They followed this with Two Mrs. Carols and then Cry Wolf. Godfrey brought out her softer side and the clothes by costumer Edith Head definitely helped. Head, who worked at Paramount, had done Stanwyck's wardrobe for double indemnity and Stanwyck wanted Head to be hired for Christmas in Connecticut. The studio head Jack Warner agreed, but to save money he insisted that they recycle the fur coat that Joan Crawford had wore in Mildred Pierce. Now it's pretty noticeable because in an early scene Stanwyck as Elizabeth Lane is getting the coat delivered. She takes it out of the box and says, what a girl won't do for a mink coat. And it's also ironic since Stanwyck once said, referring to her tough childhood and early entry into show business, I just wanted to survive and eat and have a nice coat. Warner Brothers released Christmas in Connecticut in August of 1945. It was a few months after World War II ended and this post-war comedy was a surprise hit. And it's also become a popular holiday film over the years, in part, I think, because of the magical farmhouse, which acts as an unseen character, adding a warm ambience. The other unseen character the film owes quite a debt to is homemaking columnist, author, and cookbook writer Gladys Tabor, a columnist for Ladies Home Journal, who was the inspiration for the Elizabeth Lane character, a homemaking columnist for the fictional Smart Housekeeping magazine. Tabor corresponded with servicemen during the war, sending them care packages, something that spurs the plot here. Elizabeth Lane's homemaking columns for Smart Housekeeping magazine include stories about the joys of motherhood and her life on her farm, and they've made her a household name with readers. And when she writes about searching for a perfect rocking chair, just like Granny had, readers send her rocking chairs until she's amassed 38 of them. There's just one little problem. Elizabeth is a single career gal living in a cramped New York City apartment. Her column is complete fiction. She can't even cook. Elizabeth's long-suffering architect boyfriend, the dour John Sloan, played by Reginald Gardner, works with Elizabeth at the magazine. He's asked Elizabeth to marry him, but she's ambivalent, and even though she cribs tidbits from him about his country house in Connecticut, she has no desire to leave New York City for the sticks. Going along with the ruse is Elizabeth's friend Felix Basinek or his real name was S.Z. Cuddle Sakal, who runs a Hungarian restaurant. Sakal was in fact Hungarian and he loved to cook. Now it's Felix who's been providing her with the recipes for her column. When we first meet Felix, he's feeding Elizabeth one of his mushroom omelets and Elizabeth asks, did you write up those recipes for next month's article? What am I cooking? And Felix recites her his menu. Breasts of gray dove sautéed with peaches, grenadine, and chicken soup. So spoiler alert, if you're seeing the movie for the first time, make a few snacks because it's going to make you very hungry. I always thought it might be a great idea to cook all the food that they cook in the film and then watch it. And if you do, you can prepare to flip flapjacks pancakes with Felix. Sakal and Stanwyck had worked together previously in the movie Balls of Fire, and they've got great on-screen chemistry. Elizabeth's publisher, Alexander Yardley, the great Sidney Greenstreet, pulling out all the stops here and guffaws, hears that sailor Jefferson Jones, played by Dennis Morgan, a war hero, wants his first home-cooked meal to be one of Elizabeth Lane's recipes. This couldn't be better PR for the magazine, so he arranges for Jones to spend Christmas with Lane at her family and their farm in Connecticut. Elizabeth goes into a panic, afraid to tell Yardley she's been lying, so she convinces her boyfriend Sloan to use his Connecticut farmhouse just long enough to pull off the stunt. Sloan agrees, but only if Elizabeth marries him for real. She agrees until she meets 
the handsome sailor Jefferson Jones. Sparks fly as Elizabeth shows Jones around Sloan's beautiful farmhouse in fictional Stanfield, Connecticut. Now, the town of Stanfield, Connecticut, sounding very much like Stamford and Litchfield, was created by art director Stanley Fleischer and set director Casey Roberts. Fleischer had worked on more than 100 films at Warner Brothers, many of them horror films like Them, House of Wax, The Beast with Five Fingers. He managed to build a farmhouse in Connecticut that feels so real, you'd like to look for it on a map and move there. Now, this is very important because Elizabeth's transformation begins once she enters this magical space. This is a place where love blossoms and a woman learns to cook, sort of. Hollywood's Courier and Ives on steroids version of Connecticut includes, get this, stone farmhouse so tucked away you can only get there by horse and sleigh. It's always snowing outside. Inside the wood beam living room is the largest fireplace I've ever seen. A modern but cozy eat-in kitchen with appliances. There's even a barn complete with well-placed straw and a large brown-eyed cow. When Jefferson Jones steps inside, he says, this is the kind of place I always wanted to be in, a home. And it's through his eyes that Elizabeth begins to imagine herself settling down here, but with Jones and Felix, not with Sloan. Jones is at home here. He's raiding the kitchen for a late night snack of cold chicken. He's bathing and changing the neighbor's baby's diapers. In one scene, Jones plays the piano and sings a little town of Bethlehem while Elizabeth decorates the Christmas tree. They are a picture of domestic bliss. Elizabeth has the realization, yes, this is what has been missing in her life. Now lonely and finding himself with nowhere to go for Christmas, Elizabeth's boss, Yardley, and Green Street, just terrific in these scenes, seeks comfort with Elizabeth at her farmhouse. Elizabeth has to enlist Felix, of course, to save the day as she's suddenly forced now into being a mother, a wife, a hostess, something she has absolutely no skill at. The script by Lionel Hauser and Adele Comandini does not shy away from Lane's indifference to marriage and her ineptitude as a homemaker. And the film pokes fun at things women were supposed to want to be good at, being a good cook, a good mother. It's also significant in its depiction of the many working women that appear throughout the story. Elizabeth is a working magazine writer. In the beginning of the film, there's an African-American delivery girl. She brings Elizabeth her fur coat. They wink at each other in solidarity. There's two working moms who leave their babies with Elizabeth and they go to work at a war plant. There's a VA nurse who, she's got the best line in the movie. She says, I got on the wrong train and I landed in Bridgeport. The film never imagines a future where women will return to their traditional roles as housewives, far from it. Yardley tells Sloan that he wants the prestige of Sloan and Elizabeth, a husband and wife team working at their magazine. Here's the kicker. After a romantic sleigh ride at the Stanfield Hoedown with Jones, Elizabeth says dreamily, what a night, moonlight, snow, and a cow. You think she's gonna have to decide who she'll end up with. Sloan in her career, or love and marriage, and Jones. This is not a love versus career movie. Once everyone's identities are revealed to Yardley, once everyone gets the right baby back to the right mother, the film ends with the notion that Elizabeth Lane can have it all. She doesn't marry Sloan, she ends up with Jones, and she gets to keep her job at the magazine. But my question is, who ended up living in that fabulous house in Stanfield?